mode. Hi everyone, this is Christy Smith with the Utah Cancer Control Program. We are very excited today to have Nathan Acri here to present the second webinar in our series on motivational interviewing. And so I will turn the, over, the time over to Mr. Acri. Okay, sorry about that, a little technical difficulty on my part there. Um, so this is our second session today, and you know our main thing today we're going to be talking about is resistance. Um, we're going to really quickly kind of go over some of the things we talked about last week, um, just to, as a quick review, but also to see if uh, you guys tried out some of the things we talked about. So, you know, first off, we'll talk about our learning goals today. Um, you know, the first thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be reviewing stuff from last week. So we're going to go over real quickly the kind of the main three points of what we talked about then. Um, but before today's over, I want to make sure that you learn to recognize resistance talk. That's what we're mainly going to be focused on. And Christy and I are going to do some role plays for you guys so you can kind of hear it in action. But, but again, we're going to focus on what does resistance talk look like. We're also going to learn some skills to deal with resistance. Um, so some very specific tools that you can use to overcome resistance, and we'll go into those in more depth. Um, also, if we get to it, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction to developing empathy with your clients, um, which is another way to kind of help you join with them, again, that main kind of principle of motivational interviewing, and to help you overcome some of those resistance things. The last thing we'll probably cover is we'll, we may start the ORS approach. We'll just see if we get there or not. Um, but again, that's going to be another way that you can join with your client, that you can, you know, it's going to give you some tools so you can overcome resistance again. So we'll just see if we get there or not. But, so we're going to go back really quickly to what is motivational interviewing. So if you remember, our main kind of concept there is we're learning to dance and not wrestle. And again, that dance, if you think you know, about dancing with a partner, it's about moving with them, coordinating with them. It's not, not a wrestling match, you're not fighting them. Um, you know, in a wrestling match, obviously, it's all about submission. And again, motivational interviewing is about working with your client, not trying to bully them into making the decision you want them to make. Because again, as we talked about before, um, usually those are things that, that people don't stick to or they don't uh, follow through on. So just kind of a real quick definition. Um, Again, you know, motivation is the probability a person will enter into, continue, that's the big thing here, and adhere to a specific change strategy. Because again, we want them long term to be making these changes, not just when you're in with them or when you're kind of working with them in that short little intervention. The other thing there is we, we're going to arouse in the person a sincere desire for something different. And that's the big thing here is we're looking to get people to change some behavior or to um, change some pattern that they've got or a way of thinking. Um, and so you always want to be looking for what you can do um, and for what, to help them focus on what they want. As again, we're making it about them. It's not about what we want, but it's about what they want themselves. And you know, the last little bit there is motivational interviewing draws on the theory that people are more likely to commit to change that they themselves voiced. And that kind of goes back to that change talk we talked about last time is getting them to talk about the change they want. Because again, when we say things, we typically want to believe what we say and it's a lot more impactful. Um, you know, so your primary goal, again, is going to be to draw out that change talk. And again, that's going to be a theme you're going to see you know, throughout this whole thing. We're always going to be working on how do we draw out change talk from our clients. Now, we also talked about these stages of change. Now, if you remember, we talked about each stage. You know, Pre-contemplation was that stage where typically your client is not very aware of their problem. They're not going to be um, probably too invested in changing. It's usually because somebody, um, a family member, maybe a doctor, is told them they have a problem or, or you know, perhaps even forcing them to meet or have some kind of intervention. But again, that's going to be a tough place to work with people because typically they're not acknowledging that there's much of a problem. Now contemplation, if you remember, this is one of the 
example, contemplation and preparation are probably the best stages to use this motivational interviewing. This contemplation is a stage where, again, your client's actually thinking about making some changes. They're, they're, you know, they've noticed that there's some difference, so they've moved out of that pre-contemplative state where they don't have any awareness to now, you know, they acknowledge maybe there's some problems and, um, you know, they're very ambivalent about things, which is a great place for you to start using motivational interviewing with people. And preparation, now that's where they've taken the next step where they're actually now thinking about making some changes. And, and again, you know, the main thing I said last time is if your client doesn't actually do something within 30 days, then they're back in the contemplation state. So preparation shouldn't last more than 30 days. You know, that's where maybe they're gathering their resources, they're trying to get ready to change some lifestyles, or they're drawing in some more support or help so that they can move into that next phase, which is the action phase. And typically action, you know, we don't have to use too many of these skills in action because usually people are actually doing stuff, but, you know, it's pretty easy for people to fall out of action back into the preparation or contemplation stage. And so, you know, when people are in that action phase, that's where we really want to be doing some of that confidence work. And we talked about that briefly last time. We're going to go into that in more depth probably in our next webinar, but, you know, again, that action place is really, you know, where they're trying things out. You want to help them build their confidence in the changes they're making so they stick to it. And then there's that final stage, maintenance, which typically we don't have to do too much. That's where they've actually been doing the action long enough that it's becoming a pattern and a habit, and it's just a matter of kind of keeping them going, you know, and maybe reminding them of some of their goals, some of their desires, the, the changes they've made in the past. But, but again, maintenance is usually a place where we can kind of phase out because they're doing it themselves. Now the last piece of what we talked about, and this hopefully you had a chance to maybe go and try these skills out, was you know that darn mnemonic. So and that first thing was the desire. So you know, in other words, getting your client to state the emotional reasons um, that they want to make some kind of change. Then we talk about ability to change. So again, what you know, what they can actually do. Those would be skills they have, that kind of thing. Um, reasons. And this is the intellectual piece. This is Again, what their intellectual reasons, it might be because, you know, if I don't change my eating habits, I'm going to develop diabetes, or, you know, if I don't stop smoking, I'm going to get cancer. You know, usually these are very logical, kind of proven things um, for reasons to change. Um, that fourth one is need. Now, again, just a quick reminder, this is probably the deepest, kind of the more visceral reasons why people change. You know, this could be because my wife is going to leave me, or I'm going to die, or I'm going to lose my house, or, you know, these are usually pretty serious things, and um, they're similar to desire, but typically they kind of combine the reason and the desire together to become, like I said, something that's extremely important, so those needs are, are great places to interact with people, and hopefully you got a chance to use this, I, just a quick example, I had a client in just the other day who was um, struggling with alcoholism and drug use, and you know, she's just, uh, she's had about three weeks of sobriety and um, is really struggling with not falling back into that lifestyle. And so, you know, I pulled out, pulled out my whiteboard marker and got up on the whiteboard. I have one of those in my office. And, you know, I did this mnemonic with her. You know, we talked about, you know, her goal was to stay clean off the, you know, these substances. And so we talked about her desire and, you know, she really quickly told me the feelings of, you know, hating the kind of person she was when she was using and how it made her feel. And, we talked about her abilities, and you know, we were able. She was able to bring up, well, yeah, I've been able to stay sober for about the last three weeks, and you know, I haven't been answering the calls of these so-called friends that want me to go to these parties and use. And so we were able to kind of, again, identify some of her abilities to change. We then talked about the reasons, and then she talked about, you know, well, it was, you know, I was abused several times, you know, when I was high, and I want to better myself. I hate this lifestyle, you know, I. You know, there's some pretty good reasons she had, and finally when we got to the needs, you know, that was where, again, she talked about the abuse and some of, you know, the emotional problems that had come from that, some self-esteem, depression issues, and she brought up her family, you know, about to disown her, some pretty strong stuff, and so by the end of this, um, you know, and it was funny, before I started this, I kind of just asked her, well, where's your motivation level to change? And she said, oh, you know, it's about a four or five, and after we had done this, you know, she was at an eight or nine, you know, and she was feeling really motivated to get out there and start changing. And so, um, again, this is a great, great little tool you can use. So hopefully you got a chance to use that next last week. Um, but real quick, let's uh, have you read over this. And maybe just there at your desk, I want you to read over that statement. 
Um, well, some people think I drink too much and I may be damaging my liver, but I still don't believe I'm an alcoholic or need any treatment. So again, think back to your tools from last week. And like it says, I want you to identify the change talk and the status quo talk. So maybe just we'll take about oh, 30 seconds to a minute here. Maybe on a piece of paper there, just write down or even, you know, highlight or I guess just think to yourself, what are the, where's the change talk there? And then where's the status quo talk? And then as soon as you've done that, we'll talk about this. Hopefully we'll see if you're right. So let's, uh, let's look at this. Let's see what the change talk is. So if we look, you know, well, some people think I drink too much. Again, change talk or status quo talk. Hopefully, even though I can't hear you, hopefully you just said, well, that's change talk, obviously. You know, you can say, well, why do people think you drink too much? It would be a great way to, again, ask one of those questions. And then they're going to tell you, well, you know, because, you know, on the weekends I'm always drunk, I've been spending so much money, and again, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, great piece of change talk to engage in. Look at that next little bit, and I may be damaging my liver. Again, great place of change talk. If you think back to our little darn mnemonic, you know, right there, they just gave you a reason. That might even be a need. You know, damaging your liver, liver is a pretty serious health concern. So again, great piece of change talk. Now the rest of the sentence, but I still don't believe I'm an alcoholic. Um, again, if you ask them about that, oh, well, why don't you believe you're an alcoholic? Well. Because, you know, I, all my friends drink a lot, and I can stop when I want, and, you know, again, you're going to get status quo talk. You're going to get talk that's going to, they're going to convince themselves, again, this isn't a problem. And again, um, that I don't need any treatment. Again, they're already, that's, you know, fighting against what you want them to do. So, again, they're giving their reasons why they don't need it. So, again, kind of going back to our tools, we want to stay away from that last bit of the sentence, but we do want to ask them questions about that, you know, that first little bit there. Um, so hopefully you got that right. Well, let's kind of shift over to what we're going to mainly talk about today, which is focusing on resistance. Um, so again, we're going to learn how can you learn to roll with resistance. This is going to be a really good dancing piece. So just want to want you to kind of think to yourself again: what kind of resistance do you typically see? You know, I know in my line of work, I get a lot of people who. Again, don't want to come to therapy. They don't want to give up addictions. They maybe don't want to change. You know, in marriage therapy, they want to change their spouse. They don't think it's their problem. Um, you know, they may not want to give up their favorite habit, whatever that is. Maybe it's eating. Maybe it's smoking. Whatever kind of thing. But again, you think to yourself, what kind of resistance do you typically see? Now, like I've said, resistance maybe not might not be the best way to always put this. Um, you know, it could be, again, just barriers or, again, the, the reasons they have that they don't want to change. You know, I had, uh, just the other day, I had a client come in, and I'd been working with her for you know, a little bit. And again, she's, again, this is another alcoholic. And immediately, while well, she showed up late, her daughter had to bring her. And then when she got into my office, you know, the very first thing she told me is, you know what, I don't really want to be here, Nate. She crossed her arms and had kind of a scowl on her face. And I said, hmm, okay, so here's my resistance. So I just said, well, tell me about that. Why don't you want to be here? Well, my family dragged me in, and I don't really think I have a problem, and my drinking's not that bad. And, and again, give me a lot of status quo talk. Um, so I went right to the change talk I heard, which was, well, why do you think your family brought you in here then? Why'd they drag you in here against your will? And, and, you know, for the first 10 minutes, she kept going back to that resistance talk, but I kept dialing in on that change talk. And pretty soon, you know, I had her. She was crying and telling me, you're right, I need to be here. This is, uh, you know, I'm just just mad that I've got this problem and I can't control it. And again, it turned into a pretty good session. But probably all of you have faced clients like that, that right from the start are throwing up that resistance. So, you know, the first thing is we have to recognize that resistance. It would have been really easy for me with this client to have just dived into, you know, well, why don't you want to be here? You know, you know you need to be here. And then your family, you know, you told me that you've been drinking, you know, 13 to 20 beers a day. You know, that seems like a pretty good reason. Again, that would have been me fighting for the change, not her. Um, so again, you got to think, what does that resistance look like? It can be they're arguing with you, um, they interrupt you, they're going to challenge you, deny things, that's a pretty common one. Common one. Um, blaming, I, I see that all the time, they're going to blame somebody else. And again, going back to our stages of change, you know, that's going to really help us know if they're in that contemplative state um, or from that pre-contemplation. But they're going to disagree with you, they're going to minimize things, that's a really common thing is they, they minimize the problem. Um, they might even rationalize it, you know, with 
oh, you know, my diet's bad just because I don't have the time to go and make food. So I've got to go eat fast food every day. Um, you know, make excuses. They might even yell, you know, and get mad at you. Again, those are always sessions where we come away not feeling too great. But, but again, there's ways we can deal with that. Now, the passive um, resistance is sometimes even harder to, to deal with, you know, where they ignore you or they'll just kind of agree, but, you know, they're just saying it to get you off their back. They'll do the no-show or even the boat with their feet. They'll make an appointment and they won't show up, um, which can be really frustrating, too. So, again, you've got to think about what does that resistance look like in my clients? Um, you know, the other things, you know, and this isn't always a bad thing. If we've, we've got resistance, that's going to tell us that, okay, this person recognizes that there's something kind of big going on here. Now, again, what it means, we've got to always think about this, is resistance is often considered to be a bad thing. Um, but you got to think why. And again, like I said, it, you know, a lot of times resistance shows us that there's some big issue going on here. Um, and usually we categorize it as bad because our client's not agreeing with us, um, with our agency, or you know, what, whatever it is we're trying to get them to do. And now, while resistance can sometimes be devastating in that change process, it's not necessarily inherently bad. You got to think about it. Um, resistance can be considered as a gold mine, something you know you can dig into. We're going to talk about this. Because resistance gives you a clue that there's some kind of inner thoughts um, going on in your client. Usually, again, a lot of times it links to some kind of emotional thing. Um, and it gives us a chance when we start to dig into it to understand where that's coming from. It gives us a better picture of our client and you know, it gives us kind of a bigger picture of what kind of help that, that client needs. Um, and as we do this work, you know, usually it's likely to promote their willingness to consider change and also to kind of um, join with you. Now, you know, agree, argument for the status quo, like we talked about, you know, that's, again, your client really fighting, you know, to not make any change. And so that's where we want to avoid, kind of in our example, we want to avoid, you know, getting them talking more about that. So now we're going to kind of think about this. Is it a landmine or a gold mine? What makes it different? So again, let's kind of think about what resistance serves. Um, now, how does resistance interfere with change? You know, when resistance exists, clients tend to feel justified in their position. Um, they're unlikely to be open-minded about the possibility of change. They might feel angry, misunderstood, mistreated. And typically, you know, a client's going to believe other people have a problem, not them. Now, to change, you know, we all know you've got to accept responsibility for your own change and your own things going on. Um, but, you know, it's interesting when we as professionals get in kind of a tug-of-war with clients, a lot of times we're experiencing some of the same emotions as our clients. You know, we might rationalize that the client will never change, so why have hope, or this client deserves to be treated poorly because he or she, and you can fill in the blank, they're doing whatever they're doing. Um, and under such circumstances, you know, we are kind of avoiding our main responsibility of aligning with our client and help, and really, you know, mobilizing our efforts to help them. Now, this doesn't mean that you simply agree with them. Um, you know, our first responsibility is to ensure that they're safe, but, you know, likely you're going to disagree with them a lot. However, you know, disagreeing is different than getting into a power struggle with them, which, which again, is what makes this that landmine. So you want to, want to avoid that at all costs. So we're going to look kind of at this nice little formula here. Um, you know, and this is going to kind of tell us the impact of resistance on working with somebody. So resistance can completely stall or disrupt, you know, a session or your ability to work with somebody. Now, this formula, you have A equals B divided by C. So, obviously, the larger C is, the lower your change actions, action is going to be. Um, so, just a couple examples. Um, you know, if B is 10 and C is 5, then the product's 2. Here's our little math. And if B is 10 and C is 10, then the product's 1. So, you can see how, again, de resistance can be devastating to change. So, it's critical that we understand resistance and have ways of dealing with it. Um, getting, you know, so we don't... Uh, make that equal zero, we lessen our change chance there. So now as we think of resistance as a gold mine, you know, this is when our client feels understood, um, that you're going to start to connect with them, so that empathy is going to go up, um, your client's going to feel comfortable enough to open up to you, you know, that's one thing we, you know, we talk a lot about in the therapy world, but really anytime you're working with somebody, you know, when they feel safe enough with you, they can open up about the problems, because typically a lot of these problems, you know, have self-esteem things attached to it. And it can be really 
it can be really hard to talk about some of this stuff because there's a fear of judgment and that kind of thing. So again, when when your client starts opening up to you about this stuff, you know, in a way you got to feel honored and also feel like you're doing the right thing because that means they trust you enough to bring up some of these hard issues. Now, the thing with the resistance, the the upsetting thing, I guess the good, the bad news is we can send it up. Um, you know, and this usually can occur, you know, despite our good intentions. And, um, you know, here's some of the ways that we can increase our client's resistance as we take away their control. So, again, there are times when, you know, there's sometimes when we have to do this. You know, perhaps it's um, we're in a legal situation or, you know, again, they're in the hospital and don't have much control. Um, you know, however, doing this greatly increases the risk that your client's not going to be viewed as an ally in change and they're not going to see you as that either. Um, and they might even work to kind of subvert your efforts. Um, now, arguing with clients, obviously, that kind of goes back to that tug of war. When you start to argue, you're pulling one way, and they naturally pull back. Um, overestimating the importance that your client places on change, it's risky because, first, it suggests that you don't understand what your client's goals are, their values, their priorities. Again, they're going to have different values and goals than we do sometimes. Um, there's that classic adage that says, you know, I don't care how much you know until I, until I know how much you really care. And you think, secondly, by overestimating your client's importance in change probably means that we're pushing for change before that client's ready. And this early focus will likely, you know, go into that writing reflex that we talked about where as you pull one way, they're going to naturally argue the other side. And you see that all the time. Um, now, overestimating the client's confidence, that's also going to evoke res resistance because change is hard. And simply telling your clients to do it and to ignore the role of confidence is misguided and it's not going to get you much. Um, so an example is imagine yourself teaching you know, your child to ride a bike. During the first run, you tell the child um, you'll let go and she'll sail on their own. Now, most kids will likely be concerned about crashing and they're going to argue for you not to let go and to hold on longer. So in a similar way, if, we're not, if we don't account for our client's confidence, we may get them to argue against the change, again, that crash. Um, you know, you don't want to un underestimate your client's values, priorities, and goals because this is going to draw resistance because um, we're not pursuing the goals they want. It's not important to them. Um, so maybe an example from your own life might be, you know, if I'm in the mood for Chinese food and, you know, my wife wants me to go to an American diner, my resistance is going to be probably higher because our wants and needs are different and I'm not feeling hurt. Um, so again, and we want to make sure that we understand those values. Um, you know, and I was, as was mentioned earlier, those tug of wars don't work. So, you know, in practice, that tug of war might look like you're arguing for a point, um, but refusing to hear that client's point of view. This doesn't mean that we necessarily agree with what they say, but we just don't argue. You know, we want to take different positions, but we do so in respectful ways, and often ask permission to provide an alternative view, which is a skill we're going to learn about a little later, um, which can be a really helpful skill. So that writing reflex, I've kind of, again, I've alluded to that a couple times. Um, you know, we want to do good. You know, typically we want to help others and we want to like people. Um, you know, and with those noble motives, you know, it makes sense that we're going to advocate for clients, clients to make healthy changes in their lives. You know, this reflex to do good means that we will often tend to support and argue for the good perspective while we criticize or demean the bad perspective. And that's pretty common. Now, interestingly, when there's two sides of a story, when a person is ambivalent, the good and bad perspectives are both considered to be viable options. Um, in fact, the good and the bad are often balanced and as a form of scale. So when you argue for one side, the scale becomes unbalanced. Um, so of course, guess what your clients are often going to do? When you're arguing for the good side, they're going to jump on that, uh, that other side. They're going to argue the bad side. And so as clients hear their arguments for the bad side, they're likely to say to themselves, huh, I just argued this perspective, therefore i got to believe it. So this, of course, is the exact opposite of what we want them to accomplish. So rather than telling clients how to resolve their ambivalence towards change, you know, motivational interviewing suggests that we kind of create that context that's going to allow them to work through and resolve that ambivalence on their own. So ultimately, that's going to leave them with this intrinsic, so an internal motivation to change, rather than this outside, we've got to push them and jump on that good scale there. So this stop, drop, and roll concept, you know, I really like this. You know, and this is any time um, you start to see that 
you know, resistance pop up. You know, the first thing you want to do is you don't want to further promote resistance. You know, so we're bound to see resistance with the populations we work with. Um, you know, resistance that starts, you know, a lot of times clients are going to come in and they're going to look for an argument or a fight, you know, because this gets them off the hook or they're feeling upset about it or, you know, if clients can get us into that tug of war, they can a lot of times externalize that responsibility and they don't have to look at their own issues. So that first step is don't engage in the resistance arguments because it does more harm than good. Um, so a quick reminder of when you feel resistance, you can remember kind of the tug of war, you can kind of imagine you're pulling on a rope, um, you got to stop what you're doing, don't argue, don't defend your position, and don't explain or attempt to persuade them, it just doesn't really help. You know, the next thing, drop, is you got to drop your agenda temporarily, because obviously we've got to accomplish something, in order to understand your client's point of view. You know, this is that empathetic kind of listening. Um, surely you're going to have to come back to your agenda, that's kind of why they're there to see you. Um, but we'll go into that a little bit more. Now the rolling part, you want to roll with that resistance. Um, you know, by really listening to what your client's saying. So use a lot of simple reflections. We're going to give you examples of that. Um, so they feel understood. And then once they do this, your client's likely going to calm down because they feel hurt. Um, so stop, drop, and roll to get out of the resistance. Now, we're going to review some specific skills with, which is going to help minimize that resistance and get your clients to work collaboratively with you. So here's kind of the skills we're going to be going into. And again, we're going to we're going to explain each of these in depth, and then uh, Christine and I are actually going to do some little role plays, you know, of some of these, so you can kind of hear what it sounds like. Um, now, I think in those pre-work handouts you got, hopefully some of you guys read that, you'll probably recognize a few of these, but um, real quick before we go into that, let's just really quickly kind of review how do we listen right, because we're not going to be able to do these skills if we're not doing our good listening. Um, so, you know, like it says, you got to listen carefully and think reflectively. Um, you know, I like to say, you know, approach it like the curious scientist. Kind of think of it like you're just, you're doing an experiment. And so when you hear people say something, you're going to form your best guess as to what your clients mean. You're not going to come down hard. Again, you're forming your hypothesis, if any of you guys remember back to chemistry or any of those science classes we had in college. Um, the next thing is reflect back what you think you heard, but don't try to put this reflection in the form of a question. Now, you know, some of you might be saying, well, why wouldn't I do that? You know, I'm here to kind of talk to them. And it's not bad to question, but you got to think when, whenever somebody asks a question of you, it kind of begs a response. Or it, even if they don't respond to you, it's going to cause kind of a momentary distraction. You know, and it's going to kind of break your client's train of thought. Um, you know, so again, sometimes you have to do this, but if you can avoid it and use some of these skills, it's a little bit better. Now, voice inflection is huge here. You know, you want to, normally when we, when we reflect back, you know, we're doing it in the form of a question. So the example there is, you know, and if I was talking to a client, I said, so your health really is a problem for you. Again, you kind of hear the example there versus your health is really a problem for you. Now, again, that's maybe subtle, but when I put emphasis on the for you, that's kind of throwing it back to them and saying, well, is it? Talk about it. Versus if I just say, your health is really a problem for you. That's a lot more, uh, hopefully you can hear the difference there, but again, that second one is more empathetic. It, it conveys understanding versus I'm not quite sure, so help me understand. That's with the you. And not that that's horrible, but you know, here we're really trying to focus on, again, empathize in those very simple reflections where we're not, we're, again, helping them feel understood. Um, so now we'll just really quickly talk about the levels of reflection as we go into it. And you know, again, these are going to be a little bit more, not necessarily too complicated. They're pretty easy to use. Um, but we're, again, we're going to move from simple to deeper reflections. And as you get better at these skills, you're going to be using the higher level ones. But to start, you'll use the really bit, the basic stuff. So you know, the first level, and we don't really talk about this, and that's just the you know, being the parrot, simply repeating exactly what somebody says. You have to be careful about this because, again, if you do it too often, um, it gets really annoying. If you've ever had anybody repeat back, and probably I remember my younger sisters when I was little would do this just to make me mad. So probably all of you have had that experience, but you gotta, you gotta try to don't be doing this too much. And the second level, and this is the level probably you're going to use the most, is rephrasing what the person said so with just a few little substitutions. And we're going to show you what that looks like. We're going to do um, some simple reflections and. Um, which embody these perfectly. Um, 
you know, and this is, again, a good way to start building resistance. And the thing I always say is if you start to feel a lot of resistance or you don't know what, what to do next, use this as your go-to skill. You know, go back to just doing some simple reflections because, again, if you're getting a lot of resistance and you're kind of at a loss as what to do, then you probably need to go back to building this empathy or this joining with your client. And this simple reflection is going to be a good way to do it because, again, if you're doing it right, your client's going to feel heard, they're going to feel understood, and it's going to give you the opportunity to do both of those things better. Now, the more advanced is paraphrasing. This is where you make a big restatement of what that person said. Um, you're inferring meaning and and again, you're kind of repeating it back to them. And this is going to be more along the lines of our complex reflections and some of the other things we do. But this is a little bit more advanced, but it can also make people feel much closer and much better understood. Now, the top level, and this is something you'll get better at in time. You know, typically most people aren't really good at this to start, but it's a great communication tool. And, and this is reflecting back the feelings. So you not only listen to the context of what they're saying, but now you're listening for what is the feeling driving this, whatever they're saying. Because that's usually the real thing. And typically a lot of times that's going to link to some kind of insecurity um, or you know, it's going to be wrapped up in some kind of self-esteem issue. And when you're getting there, that's when you're really going to make a good connection with your client. You're going to get some real change. You know, going back to our darn CT method there, you know, that's, we're likely talking about the need there, you know, which is the really important stuff. So. We're going to kind of shift gears here. We're going to actually, now we're going to talk about kind of the first one, which is simple reflection. So let me tell you a little bit about it, and then uh, we're going to demonstrate here real quick. So the simple reflection, and again, it almost never goes wrong. It's a wonderful way for your clients to feel heard, and it helps them be more open to considering change. So just some examples of simple reflection. So your client might say, you don't understand me. You don't know what it's like to have all my problems. The response could be, oh, so you feel misunderstood. Or even, I must be missing your point. In very simple reflections. You know, here's one I hear this all the time. My child's evil. He's always getting into trouble. So again, inside you're probably laughing, but you know, my response would be, so your child is difficult, or it's hard for you to manage your child. Again, so just kind of some some very simple responses. And, and remember, don't confuse this with the parroting back. We're not parroting back exactly what they're saying, but we're, we're saying back really closely what they say. So. Real quick, I'm going to have Christy here is going to throw some resistance to me, and I'm going to respond with just some simple reflections. I'm just too tired at the end of the day to go exercise. So you tell me it's really hard for you to exercise at the end of the day. Okay. Yes. Another one? Go ahead. Throw me, throw me another one. Um, I just don't have enough time to exercise. So you really don't have enough time in the day to exercise. There you go. Do, throw me one more. Uh, healthy food is just too expensive to buy. Healthy food's really costly. It's hard for you to buy it. So again, if you listen to that, it was very simple responses to kind of what she said. It didn't have to be complicated. And again, I know this kind of sounds a little forced because we're role playing this here. But, but the thing, this is what I'd encourage you to do as we go over these skills is on a little piece of paper, write them down. A simple reflection, maybe an example so you can remember it, and again, try it out today. This is one of the easiest ones, and maybe just in, in a conversation with a coworker, do a couple of these and just see the responses you get. And again, they're not going to know what you're doing, and even though sometimes this feels a little canned, you know, where you're thinking, okay, I read this in a training, and you know, I just learned this, but, but again, the people you're going to do it with, they're not going to know the difference. Um, and after you do it a few times, it's going to get a lot more natural, and it'll flow easier, and you'll actually probably see some good responses. So we're going to move past the simple reflection, and now we're going to talk about the complex reflection here. Um, now, again, complex reflection, so it can be a little bit it's risky sometimes, because now you're making an assumption about what lies beneath the client's surface message. Now, if you're correct, your client's going to feel understood. Um, and they might even have a chance to learn about themselves. But if the client's not ready to hear or accept the deeper side, um, they might deny it more. So just some examples you know, that I kind of wrote down was your client might say, you know, you don't understand me. You don't know what it's like to have all my problems. Um, again, you know, your response there might be, you know, you're really not feeling connected to me and you think that I don't understand. So again, that's, you know, I'm taking a little bit of a risk where I'm saying, you know, what I'm saying, but but again, if you do this right, 
typically you're going to get, again, a pretty good response from your client. They're going to feel, again, a lot closer to you and, and a lot more heard. So, again, we're going to do a little example here. I'm putting Katie on the spot, but I'll have her do maybe two of these and just listen to how I respond to these. Okay. My family just doesn't like to eat healthy food. They don't think it tastes good. So it seems like your family hasn't ever really developed good healthy eating habits because they just don't really like healthy food. I don't have anywhere safe to exercise. So you're really worried about people seeing you exercise or maybe not even having enough room to exercise. Okay, if you notice, and I'll, I'll use that last one as an example, that's a great one. Um, you heard the complex reflection was me taking a guess that the client was feeling unsafe, well she said unsafe, but maybe a little bit insecure about the exercise in it, and it could be, again my guess would be either it could be she doesn't want somebody to see her, or, or again it could quite literally be that she doesn't have a big enough place to exercise, but isn't quite motivated enough to maybe go to the gym or somewhere else where there is enough space, because again that first reason of feeling a little uncomfortable about things. So, so you see how I made a guess about what was going on, could be right, might not be right, but, but again if you are right, you know, it's a great opportunity to kind of develop, um, again, some closer empathy with your client and help them feel understood. Um, now, the amplified reflection, this is, I always laugh because my wife is great at doing this to me all the time, so I'm a great expert of what it feels like to have this. Now, the caveat that I always say with amplified reflections is some people have a great personality for this, but I guess let me back up. So an amplified reflection, it's designed to get your client to argue the other side of their resistance. So in essence, you're taking their argument or resistance and you're agreeing with their perspective, but you're exaggerating a bit. So this response, um, it's kind of like reverse psychology. You know, so sometimes it can come off as manipulative or manipulative or condescending, so you have to be really careful. Um, so there's some big risks that go along with this. So you know, one that I just wrote down was uh, you know, going to parenting classes is a total waste of my time. I need, to be, I need to be earning money to pay my fines, not listening to a bunch of stupid advice on parenting that I already know, says one I heard recently. So my response is, so you just know everything there is to know about parenting, and you'd get nothing out of that class. Um, so the goal, and luckily it worked this time, you know, is to get my, your client to say, well, I don't know everything about parenting. I guess maybe I could learn something from those classes. Um, you know, it's just that I'm busy and I need money. So, so again, the, the point here, and like I said, if you have one of those sar sarcastic personalities, this could be a great one to use because it can kind of be a little humorous, but, but at the same time, you're, if we go back to that writing reflex, you're fighting the side of the negativity, so you're unbalancing the little balance, the little scale there. So the hope is that your client's going to jump on the positive side. Now, certainly I've done this sometimes, and the client said, yeah, you're right. I don't. I won't get anything out of the parenting class. I'm glad you understand. So I don't have to go now, right? And then, of course, you know, I'm smacking my head, thinking, "Oh, great." So you have to again. You got to be really careful with this one, but it can be a great tool to use. And I think you know the thing I've learned that helps this be effective with me is you got to put some inflection in your voice. So you got to really make it either obvious that you're exaggerating things or you're being sarcastic, so they kind of get the point. Um, or else, again, they're probably going to align on the side you don't want them to align on. So we'll just we'll try this. This one doesn't always work so great, but I'm going to have, again, Katie throw uh, two things at me, and I'm going to try to respond with this amplifier. Okay, when I do exercise, I really don't see any improvement. Yeah, when you exercise, nothing good happens. You're just not having any improvement, are you? Okay, and healthy food just doesn't taste very good. Healthy food, is, healthy, healthy food is horrible. It's disgusting. You'd never want to eat that stuff. I mean, there's not any good healthy food. Okay, so, and that's probably one you guys have all heard. Again, my son loves to tell me that. Um, but again, you notice I'm, I'm really trying to exaggerate. I'm trying to, you know, kind of make it funny at one hand. And typically when you say that, almost, almost always, if you've done it right, you're going to get the client that says, well, all right, well, I kind of like green beans. or They're not all terrible and horrible, but... You know, I really don't like blank, blank, blank. So they'll probably come back with that, which again, using your change talk skills, you would real quickly say, oh, well, why do you like green beans? Tell me about that. And so again, you're going to cycle with these skills. But, but again, my warning there is use that one carefully because um, it's not always going to work. 
Now double sided, this is probably my favorite of these little reflections. Um, you know, in the double sided reflections, it, it honors both sides of the resistance talk. So we're, we're speaking directly to the, ambival the ambivalence. Um, so the client's going to have the opportunity to hear their ambivalence mirrored back to them, which is going to allow them to kind of reconsider their, their position. So to produce that double sided reflection, you've got to simply listen for both change talk and resistance talk. So this is, you know, there is, it's going to be a little bit more than just kind of a, a short brief statement they give you. Um, so again, effective use of this is going to be when the clients are currently only providing resistance talk. So here you can reflect the, the current resistance talk and then you can put change talk into it. So let me back up and say that again. So if your client's only giving you resistance talk, you can mirror that back, but then you can maybe add in some positive talk yourself. So sometimes there's a little bit of guesswork in here. Um, so here's one that, just a quick example I wrote down. So the you know, client says, there's a part of me that wants to quit using, but I've come to rely on it so much, it really does help me relax. And so again, my response is, so drugs help you in some ways, yet you're considering quitting. So again, you see, I honored the desire to kind of keep it up. You know, the client says, well, it helps me relax, but at the same time, I ended with the, but you're considered quitting. Now, to make this this little technique the most effective, you typically always want to end on the positive because usually we as human beings, we keep that last thing somebody says more prevalent in our mind. And even if you reverse it up, it's not going to be horrible. But if you can, try to make sure you end on the positive part of that side. Um, let me give you one more example. You know, I just don't think this plan will work. It seems way too busy and unrealistic. I mean, I have to work to take care of my family, and you want me to go to a bunch of crazy classes? So again, my response might be, so the doctor is asking a lot of you, maybe even too much. And yet, as you said before, you're really committed to getting through this program. Again, you can hear those two sides. That first side is there's a lot of pressure on you. You're being asked to do a bunch of stuff, and it could be too much. But then again, I'm ending with you know the statement, you're really committed to getting through this program. So again, I'm honoring the other side of that ambivalence. So we're going to try one of these, and again, Katie's being a great sport because I didn't prep her about this, so we'll see how it goes. But uh, if you will, go ahead and throw me some resistance there. Just do two, I guess. Okay, I know I should eat more vegetables, but I just don't know how to cook them so that they taste good. So it's really hard for you to cook vegetables right, but you really, you're really committed to trying to eat it more. So again, if you heard in that example, I talked about the, the negative, which was she doesn't know how to cook them, but then I honored the desire to, to eat more. So great one. Go ahead and give me one more. I really want to exercise a few times a week, but I just rather spend time with my family. So your family is really important to you, and you want to spend time with them, but at the same time, you really want to get some time to exercise. So again, if you hear how I did that, I ended on that positive, you know, the, the change talk, the the thing we're trying to encourage is the desire to exercise, um, but at the same time, you know, we're going to honor the fact that the family is important. So, you know, the hope is you're going to help your client feel like, again, you care what's important to them, going back to those goals and values, but at the same time, we want to encourage them to, you know, start making some changes. So let's look at the next one here, which is shifting focus, um, and this is a really easy one. Um, so what it sounds like is you're going to move away from the argument that your client's at an impasse towards an issue that hopefully there's going to be some more agreement. Um, so shifting focus can be done in, in two main ways. First, you can just shift the focus and see if the client realizes that a change has been made, so you're kind of being sneaky. And second, you can guide the client to do the same by saying something like, you know, we just don't agree on this topic, and I suggest we focus on something else for a while. And, you know, my tendency is toward the second method because it involves the client in the decision, which again, we're encouraging them to be involved in this, a partner in change. Um, and the decision to stop arguing and discuss another point, again, when they vocalize that, you know, they kind of mentally say, okay, I'm done arguing with this, I'm moving on. You know, and this a lot of times is going to help your client feel as though the relationship is collaborative. Um, more of it, you know, the first, the first method can sometimes be manipulative, but, but again, I think we all get locked into these power struggles with clients sometimes, and this is a great time to use this shift focus to just kind of dodge away from um, whatever that resistance is. So again, we'll, we'll do two little quick examples here. So if you want to, 
And we smooth this stuff down. Salt just makes everything taste better, even if too much sodium is bad for you. Well, I know we've been really talking about these salty chips for a while, but, but I wonder if we could maybe focus on the exercise program you talked about. Is that all right? Okay. Go ahead with the next one. Um, exercise just takes too much time. I don't have any time for it. Well, you know, we've been going back and forth about when you could actually find some time to exercise, but I wonder if maybe we could talk about your diet for a little while. Is that all right? So again, if you notice I did that, and that was great resistance she threw to me. Um, you know, again, I honored the fact that we've been talking about this point, it's important to her, but then I suggested let's move on to something different. You know, and, and sometimes what can happen is when you move on to a different topic and get people agreeing with the new topic, so you start them saying yes to you and agreeing with you, then it could be good to kind of come back to maybe one of those things that you weren't having agreement on because Again, the hope is that you've got your client now in a better place where they're, you know, more open to change. And so then once you've got them doing some change, it's easier to make some more change. So shifting focus can be a really easy, and, and you might even be doing this already, but you now you can just label it as you're actually doing a good resistance overcoming response. So that's, that's what shift focus is. So let's look at the next one, emphasize personal choice. And this, again, another very easy one. You know, and this is, it's a wonderful method for responding to this resistance because you're giving clients a choice um, and it's almost as if you let go of your side of the tug of war rope. So if you think we're holding that rope with our client, you're just dropping it. You know, there's nothing to push on so the client's resistance goes down. Um, you know, it makes it much, much easier. I thought I had some, it's a little example I put there is, I hear that you don't, you don't believe the court treated you fairly. Help me understand what you want from our work today. Oh, whoops, that's the shift focus. Let me go to emphasize choice. Um, so just the example there is, you know, it's really up to you. You get to choose if you want to. Again, it's really that simple. Simple is you make it about them. You know, you don't force them to do anything because really we can. It's not like we're going to follow them home and make sure they eat healthy um, or exercise. You know, we really, we can make a suggestion and then you just say, you know what, but you don't have to do it. It's up to you to decide if, if this is the change you want. Um, but again, we'll give you probably two good examples here and then uh, we'll go for it. So if you'll throw any resistance you got at me, let's do two more of these real quick. Yeah, I just have too many other things to do to exercise. Well, you know, we've been talking about this for a while and, and really I can't make you exercise. It's, it's really up to you. If you want to, you can. If you don't, you don't have to. Vegetables just don't taste very good. You know, you've told me that you really don't like vegetables a lot. It's so really, it's up to you if you're going to eat them or not. You know, it, it, I'm not going to force you to eat your vegetables. I'm not your mom. <laughs> so again, you can hear, I'm trying to make it a little light here, but, but again, you're really just honoring the fact that your client has the right to choose. You know, we're not their parent. We're not, you know, some big bad policeman with a billy club standing behind them that are going to, you know, hit them every time they don't do things. You know, and really by making it about their right to decide what they're going to do, you know, we've uh, just encouraged them to do some change. Now, personal choice here, again, there, oh, there's my examples, you know, so again, here's some other ways that you can respond, you know, if you want my opinion, I can certainly give it to you, but you're the one who has to decide. I'll be glad to tell you my views, but in the end, it's your choice. I'm concerned that if I give you my opinion, then it will look like I'm the one who's deciding instead of you. That's a great one. I like using that one a lot. Um, are you sure you want to give me, give you my views? And again, most people like, don't like to be forced into anything. So this can be a great way to kind of help people feel empowered, especially when you get those clients who feel like maybe everybody in their life is pushing them to do something. You know, and, and, you know if you're getting a lot of resistance talk that's talking about family members forcing them to do something or doctors or, again, employers, then this might be a great way to kind of start building in your client um, kind of the feeling of confidence. So the last one we're going to well, talk about here is, um, is permission to provide an alternative view. Now, asking permission to accomplish several desirable things. You know, first is you have a sense of guiding and leadership. Um, you know, you give clear steps that are delineated so that the parties feel that there's a good logical flow to conversation. Um, it communicates respect for your client's point of view, which also serve to strengthen the relationship between you. Um, 
and the client has a choice whether to hear or not hear what you have to say. You know, so if they say yes um, to the bid to provide a different perspective, you know, they've just taken a step towards change by just simply expressing their willingness to listen. And <clears throat> you know, I any time that I need to tell a client something hard or you know say something that might feel like they might get offended at, I always start with one of these. I always say hey, is it okay if I give you a different perspective on this? Or is it okay if I tell you what I think your judge might be wanting or what your doctor thinks? And, and that's when I, I've almost, I don't think I've ever had a time, with the exception of a few teens I've worked with, had a client say no. You know, usually they say, well, yeah, that's why I'm here. I want to hear your you know, perspective. And then that's when I say something, well, you know what? The fact you haven't been doing your drug test makes you look like you're dirty. Or, you know, it could be, well, you know what, you are really overweight and it's certainly affecting your health or, you know, your your lifestyle is really terrible right now and you're probably going to have some health problems from it. Again, just it, it gives you a great chance to say one of those hard things and the client to not get offended by what, what they have to say. Um, you know, so again, examples, it just, uh, you know, you're just really diving right into it. So some of the ones that I wrote here, um, you might disagree here, but could I give you my opinion? Again, you're honoring the fact that they might not agree with what you say. Um, are you interested in hearing what other people have done to be successful? Again, that's you know where you can actually give advice because now you're asking permission for that to give advice to them. Um, you know, or can I give you a different way of looking at this? Again, you're all you're giving them again ways to you know agree with you giving them something hard. And I'll just this is a little harder one to role play, but. Again, this will be the last one, so I thank Christy for this, so go ahead, if you will, give me, let's try this twice. Okay, I'd rather sit down and relax than exercise. So is it okay if I maybe give you a different way of looking, about, looking at that? Hopefully she says yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, go on, turn the one. Okay, sugar and sweets are just too good to give up. Well, I hear what you're saying, but... Can I maybe give you some, can I provide you my opinion the way I'm seeing it? And it might not be what you like, but is it okay if I tell you that? Yes. Great. And, and again, it can be just that simple as you just ask permission to tell them hard news or whatever it is that you want to say to them. Um, so again, we don't, we don't, we're not all together, so we're not going to do this batting practice, but, but just let me remind you of, again, you've got the simple reflections, which are going to be, Again, just that simple restating. You're going to have the complex reflections, which is you are going to, oh good, I put it over here. Um, you're going to, again, give back a little bit of meaning. So you're looking at kind of underlying things going on there. The amplified reflection, which I call, again, the, the exaggeration one, the sarcastic reflection back out. Um, shifting focus. So, you know, if things are going in a direction that you don't want them to go into or you're just locked into kind of a tug of war or a power struggle with your client, use that shift focus. Double-sided reflection, I know I skipped past that. That double-sided reflection, again, remember the key there is you're going to be honoring both sides of the ambivalence. So you're going to talk about the good reasons to change, you're going to talk about the bad reasons to change or the reasons why they don't want to change. And, and again, to make this most effective, you want to try to start out with those reasons they don't want to change, and then end on the good reasons to change. Um, ask permission to provide alternative view. Um, again, the one we just did, uh, and, and, you know, I can't speak highly enough about that, and it just works great with clients. It's a great way to deliver kind of the, the, the information that people sometimes don't necessarily want to hear, but they'll be way more willing to hear when you do it that way. Um, and then always remember to emphasize that personal choice. You know, that again, it really is your choice of what you do. You know, we are going to really just honor the fact that everybody has the ability to choose what they want to do. Um, and we're not going to force anybody because, again, going back to that very first slide of the review, motivational interviewing is that dancing, not wrestling. The wrestling is trying to force them to do something they don't want or trying to push them into a decision that they're not ready to make. Um, so. The key here is try to learn to recognize, you know, resistance. You got to kind of going back. It's going to be it could be loud or it can be quiet. You know, think about what kind of resistance does my clients throw at me, and then get better at that stop, drop, and roll. You know, if if you're building that resistance, stop it. Drop your agenda. Don't don't make it about you, and then roll with it. Meaning you're going to use some of these tools. Now, 
I really encourage you guys, just like last, the last one we did, is to practice some of this stuff. So what I'd like you to do is write down, you know, those seven tools, if you will, just on a little piece of paper, and then take it with you. You could have it on a post-it, and the next time you're working with a client, just slap that down on your notebook or wherever, somewhere where they can't see, and then be looking at that. And maybe you just remind yourself, okay, I'm going to practice simple reflections and complex reflections. And try, try some of them out. Or do the, you know, emphasizing personal choice or asking for permission. Those are really easy ones to do, but, but try this out. You know, I know when I was a brand new, you know, therapist, I, this is literally what I did. I put this on my little notepad and I had it in my lap so my client couldn't see and I just started practicing these. And, you know, the first few times, again, like I said, it felt a little canned, it felt a little forced, but I started to see some good interactions with people and as I did this more, it just became second nature to the point where I didn't have to think about it and it became really easy. So again, try this out, whether it's with a client, you can do it with coworkers, you can do it with family members, kids or teens, it's a great uh, great population to use this stuff on. But try this stuff out. Um, let's make these tools valuable. Um, you know, and next, so our next, we're not going to go into this because we don't have time, but, but our next webinar is going to be starting with this ORS approach. Um, so we'll be learning more about that. We'll start to kind of go into how do we build empathy with our clients, um, how do we make their changes, uh, intrinsic changes, not these ex extrinsic changes that we do. And we'll also make sure we review over the stuff we've talked about. So um, that concludes our session today. Good luck trying these tools out. And my expectation is that everybody's going to practice these. So hopefully the next time we're here, you might uh, you can type in either some responses or just hopefully you've uh, had some experiences with it. So thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks to those of you who participated today. As a reminder, you should get an email in about an hour with a link to the evaluation for this webinar. You will need to complete the evaluation if you would like to receive nursing credits. Um, a recording of this webinar may be viewed by clicking on the registration link again. And as a reminder, our next webinar in the series will be November 1st at 9 a.m. Thanks, everyone.